we're here with Jeannie Quinn. I will ask you the question I ask everyone, which is how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? It is a great question. Um, I always made things. I feel like I did every craft known to man as a child. I did, you know, leather work and, you know, carving wood and every weird thing, quilling, you know, really, mm, you name okay. it. Yeah. Um, but I feel like there were a couple of moments. And so that I feel like really the biggest part of my answer is that I, kept deciding over and over again and I keep deciding it's not, I think with as with all important decisions in life you do not make the decision once you make it you make it over and over and over mm -hmm. um yeah so I think the maybe the first kind of important time was I actually did summer school at RISD so I studied art, art history as you mentioned in mm -hmm. college and Berkeley to performance and, uh, but I decided to go to summer school at RISD, I think it was six weeks, um, and it was a clay intensive. And that was when you were at college or high school? College. Okay. So it was, uh, after, what was it? I think it was after my junior year, before, anyway, it was either before or after my junior year in college. And I couldn't really sleep that whole six weeks because. I, my head was just exploding with so many ideas of things to make out of clay. I remember Ann Courier gave a presentation on cups. We had a cup assignment and she gave us a slideshow and like I had never taken a real studio art class before and had a teacher give a presentation on a thing. And I was like, cups, I had no idea. <laughs> you know, like all the metaphors and all the possibilities and like it's it's a drawing in space with lines that go in different directions and turn into volumes and you know and she showed us so many different kinds of cups and I and I literally couldn't sleep after that because I just had so many ideas about cups and what kinds of cups I could make what you what you could do with cups and what you could take the cup and I think that was that was the moment when I was like oh it's ceramics it's totally ceramics because I because as I said, I had done every craft known to man, but then this was the thing that stuck. Uh -huh. um, and that kind of blew it up. So I think at, at that moment I was like, I was like, oh, I really should be doing ceramics. But I loved, I loved going to Oberlin. Oberlin did not really have a ceramics program. They had um, classes taught by student to student in the experimental college. Mm -hmm. There was a clay co-op, but there weren't there weren't real art classes in ceramics. And I didn't really, I love being an art major and I love studying music and I didn't really want to leave. So I was like, okay, just let, we're going to set that aside for a minute. Um, but I think that, that was a big minute, a big moment. Um, and then I think probably the next big one was a couple years after I graduated from college, I, I had worked quite a few different jobs. I, I apprenticed to a violin maker in Italy. I Then I became a flute maker in Boston and then I worked as a line cook at a really great restaurant. And, you know, loved make, making things all the time. But I, I had always had the intention that I was gonna go back to graduate school. The obvious straight line thing to do was to go and get a PhD in art history. And I loved art history and I loved studying, you know, and looking at things all the time. And And then I had this moment where I thought, First of all, I kind of made this observation about myself that all the jobs that I had had were making things. And particularly at the time I was cooking and I loved cooking and I loved being a line cook, but it was all about making and not really, there wasn't really time thinking about making. You were basically making as fast as you could all the time. Um, and at a high level and working with amazing people and I loved the teamwork and all that, but it was, um, but yeah making but no thinking about making so i thought all right i'm i'm sort of at this moment where i feel like i'm ready to go back to graduate school am i going to go get a phd in art history or am i going to be a studio artist and i had also i i, I was also part-time working as an art assistant for a ceramicist at that point so i was learning more about ceramics and figuring that out and i didn't know how to how to go to graduate school for art i didn't I was like, I'm not, I knew I wasn't ready for that. And I didn't quite know how to get there. That person, Ann Smith, helped me get there. Um, 
But then I thought, well, do I want to spend six years in a library or do I want to spend two years making cool stuff? And as soon as I sort of thought about how will I be spending my time, it was crystal clear. I want to spend two years making cool stuff. It's a, it was a no-brainer. So um, I, I was not ready for graduate school, but um, Ann Smith, who I owe her a debt of gratitude and she's a dear friend to this day, um, she said, you should go to the University of Colorado and study with Betty Woodman. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and she was like, I know a couple people who went there and you know, let me connect you and you can talk to them. And so I talked to two different people in Boston on the phone about studying at Boulder. And I remember one of them, um, her name was Martha. I don't remember the last name. It's the only contact I ever had with her. She said, I have nothing bad to say about school in Boulder, Colorado. Like it was amazing and here are all the amazing things about it. And so I kind of, I felt like I kind of like, you know, but like this and jumped and from Boston to Colorado. And I remember that terrifying drive across the country with my sister uh, being like, oh my God, I'm driving to somewhere, nowhere, like further and further away from civilization, having, having grown up on the East coast. And, uh, and then I got there and I was in the studio 18 hours a day because Betty was an incredible teacher and I wanted, I, again, I felt like I didn't sleep that much, um, <laughs> both from learning, learning from her and the whole environment and just make it, having the opportunity to just make it. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that was amazing and so um, great that you were able to think about what does it mean to be an art historian? What does it mean to be an artist and what are you gonna really be happier doing? Yeah. I certainly have found that not everybody is able to think ahead and understand those things. Yeah. Getting a, getting a PhD is, um, yeah, something that it's, I decided not to do it too, mm -hmm. because I didn't think that I would be happy in this thing. And I love libraries, I love writing and research, but it's still like pretty darn intense. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think the obvious next question is what was it like to study with Betty Wood? I, I was like trying oh. to think of another question that would be more like thoughtful and surprising, <laughs> but really I just want to hear about what it was People like. You want to hear my Betty stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have, I, we could spend this whole time talking about Betty, Betty Woodman and we don't have to, but at least, <laughs> at least she deserves a few minutes. She does. She does. She does. Um, I, I often describe Betty as my ceramic mom. And I, I once said that in a group of ceramicists and somebody, somebody else said, I think Betty was a lot of people's ceramic mom. And I was like, yes, that is a hundred percent true. She was a lot of people's ceramic mom. Um, she was my ceramic mom for 25 years until the day she died. I mean, she, she took me on and yeah, she was, um, an incredible gift. She had the most unbelievable clarity that art is the most important thing, mm -hmm. period. So she was not interested in your excuses about why your piece wasn't done. She was like, she, if your piece wasn't done, she didn't bother you, she, didn't, was not, she would not waste her time with you. Um, she would move on to the people who had done their work and she would give you everything. Um, I remember, this is probably two weeks after I started as a student. I was, we had, we had a big studio this was the old building at CEO, which is it's not there anymore. Um, you know, probably almost the length of this building um, was this the classroom size. And there were doors to the outside at the end. And she she walked in through the doors. It was on a Saturday morning. It's probably like nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. She walked in because she had a studio where she she was working on the airport project, which is um, at the she made these vessels at Ballastrade for the Denver um, airport which was being built at the time. They have just been moved. They were there for many years. Probably many of you have seen them. Um, so she was doing that project at school. And I was at the other end of the room, you know, like way down there. And she, she walked in, she saw me over there and she sort of looked and she was like, Jeannie, that is not how to use, you're glazing all wrong. That's not how you do it with the brush. And I was like, how can she even do that? You know? And then she walks over and she's like, no, it's not, you're not like scrubbing with it. She's like, you have to lay down the glaze. You have to just lay it down. She showed me. I was like, okay, you know. So like the 
the most astute observer probably I've ever known. Um, just saw everything. Um, and would often notice things that I didn't think were consequential. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an, an edge or a color or, yeah, she, and then she would uh, describe it back to you. She would describe your work back to you in a way that was so helpful and memorable. I, I remember a, a show that I had in Denver that she came to, it was during an Ansika and she's, um, there was a teapot spout. I was still making vessels at the time. And she was like, that reminds me of a time that I saw Martin Fontaine and she moved her arm like this. And I was like, well, I'll, I will take, I will take that compliment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, always pulling in opera and dance and, you know, things, things she had seen all over the world. She was also a fabulous cook <laughs> and we would, we would talk about food a lot. Yeah. Um, and then I, I will also just say watching her throw was like watching a dancer. She, you know, she was tiny. She was, um, I think she was four foot 10. So another student of hers, Martha Russo would say she's a legal midget. Um, <laughs> she's like this, this tiny person. And she, you know, she made these vessels that were like, yay tall. And they were in parts, but still, you know, she would, she would throw these big things and it was in three poles. You know, she would just go, you know, you know, and it was just like, she would just like kind of breathe them into being. And you were like, that's unreal to just see her, um, she, she, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen anybody so much in communication with the material, just so part of her, so, so understood. Yeah. yeah. Well, and everything you're saying sounds a lot like, you know, what you and I've talked about the last couple of days about music and form and drawing in space and mm -hmm. trans translating different ideas into mm -hmm. physical form. So, it, and it sounds like you were already thinking about those things and that this is why it was a good, fit we were a good fit yeah yeah I felt lucky that there were a lot of points of connection with her as a teacher and I think uh I mean I was probably influenced by her much more than I even realized but some years later I was at the Archie Gray Foundation and we had a summer residence show up and somebody just walked up to me and said were you interested in Betty Whitman and I said I said as a matter of fact I was what makes you ask and he said, oh, you're used to negative space. And I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, but, but yes, you know, because so much of her work was about vessels in conversation with one another and that space between. And uh, yeah, in those, I would say, while I was at CU, but then more when I was in graduate school, I started making vessels that were arranged in, you know, sort of unusual still lifes. I would say they were kind of, um, but they were very much about vessels being in conversation with one another and, and the space and that it just kind of expanded from there into larger installations. Um, so, and again, like a really obvious question, can't help it. It's just, you're just leading me. Um, <laughs> you feel like the way she taught you has informed the way you teach? Or, yes. Or, and are there things that you see as similar and different? from, you know, intentionally now, how long have you been teaching? 27 years. Yeah. So the, the and teaching sounds like for many too, and for you, it's, it, it is in itself an art practice. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I also was thinking as you were asking your question about a moment of joy that we were experiencing right now. It is an incredible joy that I have some former students here live with me in this room, which is a wonderful thing about coming to Philadelphia is getting to connect with, you know, friends, um, artist friends who I worked with for years and, and also on Zoom. Um, I, I would say I took that from Betty. I mean, all of us would go and visit her New York all the time you know it's like whenever whenever you were in New York you always made sure you went and saw Betty and you, she would always take you in the studio and show you what she was working on and then give you a great meal mm -hmm. um and I 
totally feel like my former students are there. They are my extended family. They are so important to me, in my life, and in my, you know, they. It's such a two-way street of you know I learn from them um, as much as they learn from me for sure. Uh, what would I? I don't know if I have enough perspective to say what I have taken from Betty in terms of my teaching. Um, certainly the seriousness of it as a practice. Um, she, I feel that she always treated me from day one and I did not really know what I was doing on day one. But from day one, she just treated me with so much respect of mm -hmm. like, you are a person who has your own experiences that you need to express and that you have your own experience as an artist and I'm going, I'm going to respect that in you. And that is certainly something that I aspire to, whether or not I always achieve that. I think that's, I'm always so grateful that I, I, I always wanted to be a teacher um, and I'm so grateful that I get to teach art because I feel like it is so much about honoring that individual human. And it's so much about humans getting to be human. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends who teach in other disciplines at CU and, and elsewhere. And I'm like, oh, thank God I'm not like grading math papers uh, or because I, I really get to know who you are. I'm looking at Lisa Nelson right here. <laughs> and, um, Oh my God, I mean, I, I, I can just immediately take us back to the studio and conversations that we had there. And, you know, I learned a lot about Hildegard von Bingen from, from Lisa because she made this amazing piece, the, the fantasy collaboration assignment with Hildegard. Um, and yeah, um, so seeing who Lisa was and, and what she could make or remembering. Rachel Eng over here, who immediately started drawing on every wall of her studio when she arrived at CU Boulder, and it became this like magical 2D, 3D space that she created. And uh, it's it's such an incredible gift to, I mean, to sometimes say, like, especially with undergrads, you know, you sort of say, okay, here's the assignment, do this, and then like it's like getting to wave a magic wand, like all this art suddenly manifests itself in the universe that wasn't there before. And it's incredible. Yeah, yeah it sounds magical. Um, and that is very much related to what we were talking about yesterday, that you, you told me you think art and education are the most important things in the world. And that those two things, well, you, you, tell, you tell us what you, yeah, how you're, you're thinking about like society and those two. Yeah, suits. I, you know, I I'm gonna start crying because I, I re I genuinely feel like they are, they are such incredibly powerful forces, and they are forces for change that you can't imagine. You know, it's not it's not about like saying. I want to get here, like, like I want to solve global, global warming, or I want to get rid of racism, and we're going to walk in a straight line, because, like, you're never going to, you're never going to get there by walking in a line and, like, making a plan, but if you can, um, if you can create an educational environment that is rich and creative, and that pulls out all of the individual things that people have to offer, you're gonna get somewhere. Like, I don't know where you're gonna get, but you're gonna get somewhere and you're gonna get somewhere amazing. And, and I feel the same way about art, that, that I feel like art helps you absolutely see the world in ways that you could not otherwise imagine, that you couldn't, that you couldn't hope to understand through any other way. And, and it's so, it so transcends all the boundaries of time and gender and race and language and experience, all of that. Um, I mean, just to give a, a little anecdote that's, that's a little bit of a throwaway, but I feel like it, it does communicate it in some way. Um, I had the opportunity to teach um, at the, um, Matthias Hochschule in Germany for mm. about a month, mm. um, way back in 2021. 
And so it's all these German students. Um, a lot of them were from East Germany, and and there were also some from uh, you know Czech Republic and Poland and you know sort of former um, you know kind of behind the iron yeah behind the iron curtain. And uh, some of them spoke English, some of them didn't. Um, the first night they had a potluck for me. And I was like, oh my God, subculture trumps superculture. Like, like we're all ceramicists. So of course we all we had a potluck right before, right before this uh, this conversation. Like ceramicists have potlucks and everybody shared, you know, food that they love from home. And even though I didn't speak, I, I spoke, you know, virtually no German at the time, um, kind of didn't matter. Like I had great conversations with the students, a combination of, you know, somebody else translating or a lot of body movements yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, pointing to things. And uh, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, connecting on that other level and, yeah. and which you can get through sharing food or walking into a space, as you're saying, and looking at artwork that you don't need to understand the language. You don't need to understand. And if it's really great, you're going to get emotion and feel something that is that vibration of energy from another human that we really don't have a lot of chances to do in such a pure way, um, especially sort of with the interventions of technology. Having just those moments of contemplation is certainly why I am part of the field as well. So I just, I love um, I love that. I'm sorry, I made you cry, but <laughs> it's I'm not. Pretty, I'm actually not sorry. Cry. <laughs> I I feel like it's like a badge of honor. And <laughs> Philadelphia was um, to call Terry Groves and be like, I learned by listening to you. <laughs> Try to make everyone cry at least one time. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen so that uh, those of you, those who don't know uh, Jeannie's work. We'll get a chance to see it as soon as I move it so I can see this a lot. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so whoops, I think no, I it. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's on the big screen. I actually can make this work. Sorry, everyone. Please bear with me. Please. I don't think I can make that go away completely. So I think you can reduce it if you put on that little flat line that's in the upper left corner. Oh, that one? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. that. Excellent. Thank you. It doesn't yeah. look that. Because I don't see it on the screen. I forgot I can use this little thing. But okay, keep it. So, would you like to? Sure. About this? Um, this piece is called Perfect Lover. It's named after the Felix Gonzalez Torres piece, Perfect Lover. Uh, and I've always been interested in symmetry as a, one way of expressing the idea of perfection. Um, and I showed this piece because I feel like this is the first real installation that I made. And this is one of those situations of feeling like some somebody else seeing me and reflecting back to me who I was and supporting that. So this was a residency that I was given uh, by the International Ceramic Center in Denmark at Skelsko. And they were doing a symposium and an exhibition called Object and Installation. They invited me to be part of it. And I was like, installation? I don't make installations because I was still a vessel maker at that time. And, uh, but then I started thinking about it because I was like, okay, somebody in Denmark saw my work and thought that I make installations. And I was like, well, I make very small scale installations that are sort of vessel, you know, tabletop mm -hmm. vessel sized installations. And so just somebody naming that for me made me start thinking about installations and what is the relationship of ceramic to installation. And so this is a piece that I made during that uh, residency in Denmark. And then I got to exhibit it there in my first museum show. 
uh, in Wittefox, Denmark. Uh, and so it's made of several thousand ceramic and real Q-tips. I slip cast Q-tips out of porcelain and glazed them and then inserted them into the wall to make a kind of wall drawing mm -hmm. um, using real Q-tips towards the edge and then uh, porcelain Q-tips towards the middle. And it made me, part of what it made me think about with ceramics and installation was domestic space and uh, that I feel like domestic space is where, is one of the places that ceramics lives very comfortably. And it's a way that many people can have an entry point into ceramics. And I wanted to think, I wanted to sort of uh, highlight the ceramics of the bathroom as well as the ceramics of the kitchen that we have sinks and toilets and bathtubs and things like that so I uh, but I you know made something absurd I made the ceramic q-tip um, that's probably enough to say about that. yeah yeah um, and I think the use of ornament is something that will is also be, very important yes. yeah here and then um, it's like I've never done this before. <laughs> Why isn't it working? Sorry. There we go. This piece that so that was from two thousand one. This is jumping to um, two thousand nine. This was a installation that I did at Greenwich House Pottery in New York. It's called "Everything Is Not As It Seems." And I think I just have one image of this piece, but so you're seeing it from the side um, where you entered the room. Um, some of you may, may be familiar with, this is the old gallery Greenwich house, the upstairs parlor space. Mm -hmm. And I was inspired by the symmetry of the parlor room. And when you're in New York, you always walk around, especially at night and you're always, you can see into people's windows and traditionally in, row houses, uh, brownstones, you can you see the space for the chandelier. So I thought I want to, I want to turn the whole room into a chandelier. Mm. And there's an expectation that a chandelier will have radial symmetry. There's an expectation of the structure of a chandelier. So I wanted to play with that, that symmetry. So this piece is bilaterally symmetrical. So if you stand in the middle of the room and look on either side, it has bilateral symmetry. So there's, um, there's indicate, you can see in these sort of groupings of lights that are hanging that there's a reference to a traditional chandelier with pieces that move around in, you know, in a radial fashion, but then one piece will be missing or something will be up or down or something like that. So I, I was kind of messing with that symmetry and then you really can only see it. It kind of snaps into focus when you move your body mm. into the center. So it requires you as an actor in the piece and you understand the piece differently as you move around space. Um, so it looks like it's a cacophony. And then when you're in the center, the order becomes clear. And so that's where the title comes from that everything is not as it seems that I, at that moment in my life, I needed I needed to sort of hang on to the idea that there was some kind of underlying order. order. In the chaos. Yes. That yes. sounds like a good thing to think about right now. Yeah. Um, of course, I keep thinking about problem solving the hanging. <laughs> <laughs> but it's too connected to the um, installation requirements right now. I'm trying mm -hmm. to like shed that idea of like how did they because you're a curator yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there's a whole story on that with, yeah, probably another, for another time yeah i mean yeah with a drink okay go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is from 2010 i think and this is actually in philadelphia this is from the philadelphia arts alliance in rittenhouse square and i remember i saw this piece. oh yeah. you did mm -hmm. great uh i remember meeting with the curator and she was like uh do we need to like are the shards going to go in people's eyes? Like what's that? I was, I was like, I don't, I really don't think so. I, I mean, I'm like, I don't know. I haven't made it yet. I haven't, you know, but uh, there was some concern, but it was fine. Nobody, no one, no, no humans were harmed in the making of this piece as far as I know. So this is called A Thousand Tiny Deaths. And I looked to ceramic history, a, a favorite topic of mine, and uh, looked at the profiles of 
lots of different pots through, you know, all kinds of different histories and cultures and so on. And I, some of them I had to sort of invent what I thought they looked like in, in dimensions because I was looking at photographs. Um, and I hand built them and then made molds and slip cast them in black porcelain so that you would just see the silhouette of the piece. And then I hung each of them from a balloon that was blown up inside the object and then, you know, string hung from the string so that they were, so that ceramic history was literally being held up by my breath. Mm. And then over time, this piece was up for three months in this iteration. And over time, the my breath would leave and the pieces would fall and break. Um, so I think a, lo a lot of what I'm really interested in with ceramics is as a, as a metaphorical material, that it is both totally permanent. You know, we have ceramics that are 23,000 years old and they stay with us and we learn about other civilizations from them. And it's also totally fragile and in a moment it can break and shatter. And that you see both of those things all the time in every ceramic object. So I wanted it to be about about the permanent, about all, all of that history, the weight of all of that history, how it stays with us, and then also about the ephemeral that your breath escapes and it's gone. Oh. <clears throat> and it was, um, there's tension when you're in there, in the space in person, because you're sort of hoping that one falls oh, yes. Yes. there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And just like watching the stretching and thinking about that is certainly inherent in that idea that it's both, you know, like humans. At the opening, my family came up from DC to, you know, it was lovely to have a show in Philadelphia. And my mom, it was a beautiful show. There were a lot of great people in the show. And um, my mom, you know, came in, saw the piece, and then she walked around the whole thing. And she said, everybody's like walking around and seeing the whole show. And then they're coming back here. And the room was packed because everybody wanted to see one fall. They were waiting for it to perform and people were like, do you think it's gonna be that one? And it's really, it's very boring when it falls. I mean, it does exactly what you think it's gonna do. It falls and it breaks, you know, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't even break. And uh, I mean, there was nothing exciting, but the anticipation of it, of it falling is, I mean, people are like, people wanna see it so bad. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I didn't, I didn't anticipate that that would happen, but it was really, it was really fun to observe human behavior. Yeah, and I, I ended up showing it a, a number of times. I finally retired it. I finally was like, I am not making this piece again because you know I would get asked to show it again, and I had to freaking remake it. Yeah, and I was like, I'm done. I'm done with this piece. Yeah. <laughs> I see that, but I can also see why people keep wanting it. Yeah. Um, it's what a gift when something is has an unexpected element, un unexpected yeah. to the artist. Yes, this piece is from 2011. It's called, You Are the Palace, You Are the Forest. And I made it at the European Ceramic Work Center in Holland. Um, it, I was one of their guinea pigs for their digital, they had a, they now have, a, I think they still have it, a digital residency. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, that was just interesting in and of itself. In, in the making of it. Um, it was for a big exhibition at the Denver Art Museum on contemporary ceramics. And uh, I was lucky enough because I was one of the local artists that were in the show that I got to pick the space. I think I was the first person to pick my space in the Denver Art Museum. And it's, it's a really interesting and wonderful building um, with a lot of unusual angles. It's a, uh, Daniel Liebskind designed the building. And so there's this one corner of the, you know, the temporary exhibitions gallery, and they they call it the prow. She told me after I picked it, it's like it's this it's like the prow of the ship, the interior prow of the ship. And I said, oh, that is that is what what I want. And I started thinking about what I wanted to make for that space, and I wanted uh, to have a sense a sense of space both expanded and collapsed at the same time. So I painted the walls dark gray 
and made these branches, which are actually based literally on ponderosa pine branches mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. So I took photographs of ponderosa pine branches and drew the, um, the, you know, the profile of them and then made them dimensional using Rhino 3D. And so I wanted them to be like ponderosa pine branches and then also like chandelier arms because I wanted you to feel both like you were in a palace like Versailles, that it was like a long hallway of chandeliers and also like you were in a forest um, with these branches kind of brushing around mm -hmm. you. Um, so I made the branches, the, the largest ones are, um, they're about a meter, two feet, but since I was in Holland, they were a meter. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I made them at 100%, 80%, 60% going, going down to 20%. So the, the branches shrink in size uh, as they go back in space towards the point of the bow. And then they also get darker. So they go from white to a very dark gray. So mm -hmm. it was trying to create atmospheric perspective and linear perspective um, all at the same time. And, and also, so there was a sense of both interior space and outdoor like environmental space um and that that being also uh metaphorical of like space inside yourself that you often find when you go to the forest yeah and then the social space that you might find in a in a palace or at a ball or with other people and, and it's it's beautiful do you do you revel in the complexity of the you know, it's an installation that's sort of problem solving. Is that something that's exciting to you? And that you, like, obviously you're not, um, you're not being worried about it because you're just jumping into these extremely complicated, like, <laughs> sure, I can hang this totally complicated three-dimensional thing in space. And this one I did with a two-week-old baby, oh, like, strapped to yeah. my body. <laughs> yeah, he literally had just been born. They moved they moved the exhibition date. I can't remember. And I was like, I was like, hmm, I have another deadline that I cannot change. Like, that is, that is not changeable. Um, so that was exciting. Uh, it's not just that you had a two week old baby. It's that you had given birth, birth two, two weeks, weeks before. before. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was making pieces up until about two days before I gave birth. Um, it was an exciting time. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what about That's the installation? Another. I love the installation. And what I love is I love making ceramics where the piece isn't finished when it comes out of the kiln. Because I'm I'm pretty bad. I'm a pretty bad glazer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really like glazing very much. I mostly avoid it now. Betty noticed that right away. You were <laughs> that's, glazing that's right. incorrectly that's right. from the beginning. I know, I know. And in spite of her excellent <laughs> teaching, I, I still fail her in that. Um, I mean, I, I do still sometimes. I Sometimes I glaze. I often don't. Um, but what I, I mean, I think ceramics has such a, it ha there's such a structure to the making, which is a thing that I love about it. And I love that about teaching ceramics that it's like, you make it, you let it dry, you put it in a kiln, you know, you bisque fire it, you take it out, you place it, you place fire. And that can be so helpful in propelling you forward mm -hmm. as a, in your process as an artist. It's like, you know what the next step is. But with my work, I, I don't know. I don't always think I'm, I'm not that great at glazing. Sometimes I think I'm not even that great at sculpting. But I have another, I have another chance to make it good, which is in the arranging it in space. And, and I think that is probably what I'm actually best at hmm. is taking something, taking an object and giving it a relationship to other objects and a relationship to architecture and a relationship to space. And that um, getting that extra step, that extra chance to make something is always really exciting to me. So it's actually using the word relationship in relationship to different aspects it's kind of like you're teaching yes you know, you're interested in relationships between people and yes between themselves and their artwork and yes it's great makes a lot of sense um, this is a detail of a piece with a really complicated title that i will i will mess up but i shouldn't have written it down 
but um, you know what? You okay. are the expert. We don't even need to know <laughs> yeah. the title. Just tell us that. Yeah, thank you. Um, this I made this piece in Philadelphia. Um, my last sabbatical eight years ago, uh, I got to be here, and I chose to be here to be close to family, and it was that was a great experience. And I had a studio in the building I can see right out the window here, at the old That's school crazy. right there, right here in this neighborhood. Um, and I made this for a show at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Um, and I made it specifically for yet another amazing building and an amazing architect, Santiago Calatrava. Mm. Um, the Milwaukee Art Museum, if you have never been, take a field trip, it's a stunner, I'll tell you. And there were these beautiful bays. It's kind of like a very contemporary cathedral. And just to circle back to Betty Goodman for a minute, she described, she said, you know, she would say, I am not a religious person, but art is my religion. Mm -hmm. And you absolutely felt that being with her. Like she had that kind of faith in art. Uh, so Calatrava is kind of, it's kind of con a very contemporary take on Gothic architecture. And so I had this bay to work with and made this piece in which, um, I would say this is this was the piece where I maybe most consciously first really played with something that was quite literally symmetrical and where the symmetry became almost invisible. Mm. So there is a, I mean, you're seeing it, this, this is a, an oblique detail, so there's no way that you could see it here, but there was a, uh, there was a spine down the center of the piece. And then each of these, metal frames that the ceramic pieces hung from had a silhouette that was matched on the opposite side of the spine mm -hmm. that was made out of clear vinyl. So it was like a, sh a shadow, but it was also when the light caught it in a certain way, it would have a sheen to it. So it would become pure reflection. Um, so what was three-dimensional became two-dimensional mm -hmm. and vice versa. So it was this playing with dimensions back and forth, you know, 2D to 3D. And then it was also playing with black and white and playing with an organic form. These forms were based on a um, drawing of a piece of lace from a collection of the Victorian Albert Museum. So the, the black forms are the, the forms from lace, which have been kind of cut up and dissected. And then these very architectural forms of the steel, um, light and shadow. So it was, it was kind of trying to marry all of these opposites and create something whole. Mm. And then I wanted to put this in because I recently took a foray into public art and I've done a couple of public art pieces. I never thought that it made sense for me to do public art, although I had a couple of big public art heroes and a couple of public art pieces that meant so much to me. Um, you know, like uh, there were a couple on my commute in Boston when I lived in Boston. There's a Max Harry's piece at Davis Square that just gave me joy every day to see that piece. Um, she's probably the biggest one, but there, I grew up in Washington, DC. There's a lot, it's more monuments, but there is a lot of yes. public art. And I loved that, the accessibility of it and just, it belongs to everyone. You don't have to even go to a special place. It's here, it's in your daily life. So um, there was a, a curator who saw a um, show that I did at Smack Mallon in Brooklyn. And she was like, she, she was an, it was um, Sarah Red, oh. uh, Radstone, Sarah, I'm not gonna put, that's, that's not quite it. Anyway, she, she came and she saw my show and she was in charge of Percent for Art in New York oh, at the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, she now works at the Rubin Museum. And she said, you should do public art. And I was like, you know, my work is all about fragility and impermanence. Like, I, I, I don't really see that. And she's like, that is a solvable problem. And she said, you know, you create space, you interact with architecture, you make things that are beautiful. People will, will really respond to this. It, you, you have so many of the skills that, that, we, that we need in public art. She said, send me, you know, submit your slides, get in the registry. I don't even remember doing it, but apparently I did it. Um, <laughs> cause I, I still had a young, a little baby at this time and I was sleep deprived and, uh, and then they called me and they said, you're a finalist. Cause that's how they do it in New York. And would you like to design a piece for, so this is a school in lower Manhattan. It's at 75 Morton street and it's a school for 
um, two thirds of the kids who go there are, um, have autism spectrum disorder. And so the piece had to hang from the ceiling because they needed kids to be able to not look at the piece if they didn't want to look at it, if it was too overstimulating. And um, my son had recently been diagnosed with some sensory processing issues. And so as it turned out, I had learned a lot about sensory processing mm -hmm. issues and was able to design a piece. So I called this hanging garden um, because it turns out that our nervous systems are attuned to the natural world. And I had noticed that my child as a son, my, my son as a, as a baby, when he would be upset, if we would just go outside, he would just calm down. That was like the, the instant fix for everything was to go outside. So, I mean, of course it, you know, inside of schooling and happened there were limitations of what I could do, but there was natural light. And so I wanted natural light to be filtered through these pieces, which are made of cast resin. Mm. And they are made of, um, they're designed after printers ornaments because this neighborhood was the neighborhood of printers. In New York, so each of these is based on a on a printer's ornament designed by a printer in that neighborhood. <clears throat> so and then, of course, they're all natural forms and alluding to the natural environment. And sitting in Philadelphia um, with our, you know, rich architectural history, uh, you know, history of craft sort of infused into the streets. That idea that you would be in conversation, in relationship with. The history of the art that had been happening in that neighborhood for hundreds of years is really meaningful um, to me. We don't have too much more time. And on that note, although I want you to talk about the rest of I can't remember how many more I there are. There's just a couple more. Okay. Yeah. I, I want can, to I ask easy, you. But, um, so, yeah, finish telling us about this. And I'm going to ask you about the housing profile oh, oh, on your oh, studio okay. and what's yeah. next. Yeah. Um, this is based on a piece of lace that's deconstructed and then hung with, so these are ceramic pieces um, hung with pins on the wall. We can leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said amazing work. Uh, oh, wait, I skipped that one. Okay, yeah, there you go. This is called Cut Lace, and it's a laser cut piece based on a drawing of a piece of lace. Um, and then the paper is folded. And this is actually currently in a show in Denver. Uh, Michael Warren contemporary and th that's a detail just so you can kind of see what's going on but. well and that is a good um segue into actually this next. deals with this the, is a better this, segue go ahead this well this too no go ahead and ask your question about molding profiles yeah. because because that red piece hmm. is based on that drawing that you're about to ask about. oh okay so for this you you know we were talking about your practice extending to drawing and thinking about lines and of course lace so linear and that's the fact that you're using it to make something flat and I think you know thinking about that partially because of COVID restrictions and having um, less access to play was part of it but um, yeah I was really excited to walk into your space and see some historical architectural drawings of molding profiles which are you know for those of you who don't know, <clears throat> the crown moldings and things like that, when they're designing them, they show it like a slice, a side view of what that image looks like. So tell us yes. about this one. So this, uh, you know, if you, if you were looking at that drawing that you saw in my studio <laughs> right now, you would recognize this, the, the silhouettes of these pieces are exactly those silhouettes. Oh, okay. Um, so I started with, that drawing and traced the, the silhouettes of the profiles um, and then used, you know, blew them up and used those as patterns to create just a, you know, a drawing to start with. Um, I got, I was at home like all of us during the pandemic and my big splurge was I bought an extruder for my home studio and I had never really played with an extruder before. And I was like, okay, I'm home. Let's let's see what happens. Um, I had I had a lot of other plans for that year, as we all did. I was like, okay, my new plan is an learn extreme three languages, <laughs> craft dish for pillows. Yeah. yeah. So, and it turned out to be really fun to play with an extruder and to and to use, you know, to create ceramic lines because I think of my practice so much as a drawing practice, but I don't really make lines with ceramics. Mm -hmm. And so I could, you know, just like create this physical 
material line and use it to draw. And then, and then I, you know, began drawing it in three dimensions with them. So this, this comes off the wall, at probably about 18 inches altogether. Mm -hmm. So making these arch forms and uh, different, different shapes. And, and so it, it was both very structured and absolutely based on a historical form, which my work always is, it always starts there. Mm -hmm. And then it was totally improvisational in this dimension, you know, mm -hmm. the dimension of this, that's coming out from the wall was 100% an improv. Mm -hmm. And then um, I created this first show in Montreal called XYZ that was the, it's a ceramic biennial they have in Montreal. And uh, the curator chose five artists who work with digital fabrication. And so I was also like, okay, how am I gonna, how am I integrating digital fabrication into this work? And I changed my mind a thousand times. And where I landed was I drew the shadows of the piece um, and cut out clear vinyl to create the shadows. So mm -hmm. like you can see, mm -hmm. can I do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on the, on the left side here, these shadows are made from clear vinyl stuck to the wall, but they are exact drawings of the shadows of these pieces if you had a light like over here. Mm. So you can see the real shadows here, you know, these dark shadows. And then you can, these are, these are material shadows that are made from vinyl. That's great. So, and it's called dust in a shadow. I I prop them up. I make I make props, and it sometimes I hang. I, I like I make a little thing for it to hang from, or yeah, because I I mean there there was some movement for sure in the kiln, but I tried to minimize it. Yeah, I didn't I didn't show a whole other project where I made porcelain clouds that every single cloud was actually hung in the kiln. So I do a lot of weird kiln acrobatics <laughs> to get to get what I want. Yeah. Highly impractical, not really recommended, but yeah, but I do it anyway. <laughs> so in the not too long few minutes we have left, do you want to talk a little bit about what you hope to do here at the Play Studio for the next month? I I felt like this was a fantastic opportunity to push the reset button. Um, I mean, as I said right at the beginning, I so I've been department chair for the last three years during the COVID years and have, you know, that's been quite consuming to say the least. Mm -hmm. And so while I have managed to continue making work during that time, it's, it's all been kind of fast and mostly kind of things that I already knew how to do or drawings because that was what felt available to me. And I, I was really excited to have an opportunity. I, first of all, I wanted to not just be ending something, but I wanted to be starting something else. So I was really excited to have a chance to be, to say, yes, I am starting being a full-time artist again, you know, for this moment. And I feel, it feels like a blank slate. Like I actually don't have big expectations about this time, except, you know, what I said to you on the phone was, I, I want to meet people and make connections with people while I'm here. I feel like residencies are amazing opportunities to make connections. Uh, I, have, I have one small piece that I need to make that I have to ship out you know, at the, at the end of August. But other than that, I'm, I really wanna experiment and play. I think also being in a new space often and having new tools and different people around lead to different things. And so often at the end of a residency, it's, it's often not a finished, mm -hmm product but it often leads to the next big thing big that leads to the next big idea yeah so I'm looking forward to a lot of thinking and experimenting and talking and like that great yeah does anyone have any questions in person or on zoom feel free to either take yourself off mute and ask or just put it in the chat I mean, it's really perfectly in art. And I wonder, Betty Woodman, I think of as most spontaneous colors. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely a colorist. So I'll just repeat for people who are online, the question was about whether yeah. use of color has been you know, important or how, how do you think about your use of color? 
I often use colors in the paint of the wall in the room in which I am installing my work. So those colors are very deliberate and are part of the piece. So that last one is Benjamin War Ra Rapture Red. Um, it's a gorgeous red. And that's that's absolutely part of the work for me. Um, and I, ha I have done some pieces. Um, there's another uh, commissioned piece that's in a hotel in Boulder in which I actually, um, I use tons of glaze. It, it was, it's all super colorful glazes because it's, uh, I, I remade all of the flowers and weeds that were in a particular park near my house. It's called, it's called all the, it's called all the, all the flowers in Martin Park. That's really all the weeds in Martin Park. Um, so at times, but it's, it, and I'm very conscious about the colors that I choose, the wall colors. There have been some other pieces that have had more elaborate painting on the walls um, with then ceramic pieces in front of them, but not not a great deal of ceramic color, some. So it's the material still looks like the material itself, you're not masking it at all. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's a good description. Raymond. You mentioned earlier that you studied Baroque music performance, mm -hmm. and I kind of feel like I see a Baroque mood on it in your work. So, could you tell us, like, did you play an instrument or what about all that? Growing up, I played the cello primarily. I, I played piano and studied voice, um, but cello was my was my main instrument. And then in college, I switched to viola da gamba, mm -hmm. uh, which is a Baroque instrument, uh, string instrument. You know, kind of analogous to the violin thing. And yeah, I, ornaments. Ornaments, yes. Mm -hmm. And and learning Baroque music, you learn how to ornament. It is, it's also, I mean, you could certainly make a, an analogy to my like the process I just described, where there's a ground that is defined, um, that is, you know, certain notes and certain chords, and then you ornament as as a Baroque musician. It's the notes are not all written down. You learn how to ornament on the music that is there. Yeah. I feel like that's that's what I do in ceramics. <laughs> and then I, I'll just add the this idea that when you were talking the other day about you know, forms, new forms that you're thinking about and how to alter, you, know, you talked about this kind of connection between the Baroque and the Rococo. Kind mm -hmm. of, I mean. You know, Baroque is already exaggerated, and then this idea of kind of flipping symmetries and stretching symmetries that mm -hmm. is part of your work as well. Yeah. That's yeah. A good question on there. I mean, I, I will say I, I haven't totally figured out my relationship to the sort of class issues of the Baroque and the Rococo, which feel, it feels, feels a little weighted down, but. I don't know, but on the other hand, there's also like all those amazing public, you know, public spaces like you know the churches and you know that like were there for everyone to enjoy. Um, I this is one of those things like I can't even tell you what like why do I do this? It's one of those things like I I just do it. I have to do it. I don't know, but I but I love ornament and I think maybe maybe it has to do with I mean with both the Baroque and the Rococo, ornament really comes off the wall. Ornament becomes matter and material. And I also feel like that is something that I do in my work as a ceramicist. I, I am often, you know, I'm, I'm always using some kind of historical material, be it a textile design or, you know, lace, um, a surface design from another, you know, ceramic piece, whatever it is. And, and I'm taking that pattern and, pulling it out into space and turning that ornament or that decoration into a thing mm -hmm. that you can hold. And maybe that's, I mean, I feel like they did that in both the Baroque and the Rococo. That's part of my interest there. Absolutely. And although, of course, I mean, you can't deny class and race issues in every part of art history, I guess the, the part that I respond to is the connection to the thinkers of the time, mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. the fact that it's all just you know I've said a few times the connection to music and dance and ornament and food, all everything was connected, and there, you know, the philosophy of the time mm -hmm. is encapsulated in my in, in those ornaments and in the ways mm -hmm. that they 
you know, you can think about um, Enlightenment era mm -hmm. philosophers, and then you look at a, a piece of artwork and you can say like, oh, well, I understand why they were literally changing the perspective yeah. in order to, yeah. you know, as they were kind of changing the perspective of, from religious to humanist yeah. ideals. And that, yeah. that it is, the ornament was the physical representation of, of that. And so the fact mm -hmm. that you're kind of using those things and separating them, as you're saying, very related to what was happening at the time. And and what does it mean today? Like how how are our societal ideas being represented mm -hmm. in the artwork that we're making mm -hmm. and those relationships? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there is this attempt at times to act as though our visual vocabulary and our visual culture is something separate. But what's interesting as an art historian is a hundred years later when you can kind of look back and see how they were all in the same story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well thank you. Thank you. We've gone over as we did last week as well because <laughs> it's so fun. I'm sure we could keep talking for another three hours. <laughs> but we'll just thank everyone for coming in person and thank you for being here with us online.